Alright, we're going to continue our, with our uh, um, chapter one. Uh, we had stopped um, in terms of speaking about the history and the concepts of boundaries. Uh, we stopped. On page 18, we were talking about the Um, continuation of the, the the section of rights and interest in land and, and composed of bundle of rights on page 18 under early common law the people who possess season in reality own a collection of rights um, the tenants holders right become known as his estate so all those rights were actually brought together and referred to um, uh, is considered to be the entire estate of a tenant. Estates differ primarily in length of time for which they may they might exist. An estate is a degree, um, a more uh, a, a, a more open or generic definition of an estate. It's a degree, the quality, the extent, and nature of the interest that a person has in real property. So uh, this definition, generic definition, actually encompasses all of the bundle of rights, um, the nine rights that we mentioned in, pre in the last lecture. An estate may be either absolute or conditional. In most instances, fee simple connotes absolute. Absolute interest, there is no contest or, uh, in terms of the ownership of that, of that property. Today, all estates are classified as freehold or non-freehold. Freehold estates are divided into two, um, into three actually, three, uh, fee simple, fee tail, and life estates. You want to be knowing those the different types of um, freehold estates. Uh, fee simple estate is the highest and greatest estate in the land that one can obtain. So when you buy properties, actually a lot of those properties that uh, you buy as an uh, individual, Mm. It's fee simple estate. Uh, those who possess a fee simple or fee simple absolute estate are, for all purposes, the owner of the land. So, purchasing a property is indirectly you are actually buying a fee simple estate, absolute interest. Fee, what does fee simple means? Fee, first part of the term, fee denotes that the estate is one that can be inherited. Or devised by a will or other document. So the first part in fee is actually re related to the ability to be inherited or um, uh, has the ability to be willed to another or other documents. So simple done. Now the second part of the fee simple. Simple denotes that the estate is not a fee tail estate wherein that estate must be inherited by a specific person. Absolute means that there are no conditions or limitations. So note the meaning um, in fee simple, what does fee, fee rep represents and what does simple represents. Uh, fee tail, uh, in the next paragraph, also called estate tail, and is, is that in an English is an English type estate which in all probability was borrowed from the Romans it is true freehold estate limited by the grantor to the heirs of the grantee's body. So basically the, the fee tail you can um, it can be inherited uh, by the heirs or the, the siblings of the owner or to a special class of people, either male or female. So fee tail is basically, there is a specific um, group of people that can get access to the land upon the debt of the owner. If the conditions are breached, the estate reverts back to the grantor. Um, not commonly used, but it's still the English type of estate. Uh, life estate is considered a freehold estate because it can be conveyed to a third party yet its duration is measured by some life so it's the time span of a particular uh, owner or grantee in essence the life estate lasts only for the life of some person 
unless you put a will, of course. Life estates may be created by express provisions or words in a will or deed or by contract between heirs or parties in interest. In particular, a dower, a dower is for um, widows or a, courtesy, uh, or, or a courtesy for a widower. So you can have a dower for life estates or a courtesy for a widower. Page 19. Um, he or she may not commit waste of the estate. The second paragraph. Um, by reducing the value of the estate or making an unreasonable use of the estate proper. The whole of the life estate is obligated to pay taxes, to, to make all necessary repairs, and in some instances to provide the necessary insurance to protect the property. So um, you being an owner of a property, you do have certain responsibilities um, to making sure that that property uh, is up to date in its taxes and all, all of all, all, all the other requirements in terms of any additional um, upkeep of it is the owner's responsibility. A survey should never go beyond the words in the document. So you want to make sure that um, the survey, whenever he or she is asked to go and survey a property, um, stays within the professional um, uh, standards of practice, uh, but also being able to be a professional in doing the work, making sure that they are, um, you know, he follows the footsteps of the original survey in order to do a resurvey of that property. Should never go beyond the words of the document. Should never assume things. If a researcher neglects to call attention to a possible problem and the client suffers damages, the researcher could be held liable. Similarly, if the surveyor does um, do an, some inferences in terms of the words that were used and misinterpretation of it, he can be liable for um, damages as well. Section 1.10, role of the court. All aspects of real property are protected and litigated in the respective state in which the land is situated by the Fifth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. Um, and the role of the court do play a significant part in determining whenever there are any um, conflicts. Since the titles, next paragraph, to the land in the United States originated from foreign sources, and the Constitution recognizes all prior valid rights in the land Approximately 20 states are legally recognized as their meets and bounds states. So those original 10, 20 states in Northeast were referred to as the meets and bounds states. States basing their real property and service system on the English common law, those 20 states. And the law applies to in situation regarding land, title, and boundaries. In states that base their titles and service on the USPLS, that originated under several public land laws, those laws apply under which the land was surveyed and uh, patented. So um, the history of the changes in land ownership for, from earlier on to present day is certainly properly documented in multiple cases in many statutes and legislature. Uh, and and the, the court plays an important role to enforcing those um, decisions that were made long ago and continue to do that. The role of the court on page 20. Uh, the survey's responsibility, top paragraph, is to collect those evidence of past boundaries described in documents, to collect evidence of possession and use, and to create new evidence to be left for future surveys in the case of subdivision. In, quest in questions of title or boundaries, the surveyor can then be called to give to his testimony of what he collected out there in terms of evidence and let the judge or the jury decide upon where uh, and uh, de to decide upon what is the boundary, not where it is. Attorneys, on the other hand, are the means by which legal questions are presented to the courts. Uh, what boundaries are in question is, is, a, is a question of law, where boundaries are is a question of fact. So the question of law is what the legal profession is, 
involving and a question of where the boundaries is what the survey is directly involving quiz quiz on that in applying um, second to last paragraph for the at the bottom of the page in applying this uh, statement courts will attempt to ascertain the application of common law doctrines such as adverse possession, estoppel, and agreement to boundaries, whereas juries would determine which of the two surveys will be trusted in testimony. So uh, a lot of legalities and past cases and common law doctrines do play an important role in deciding on boundaries. Surveyors will ascertain the interpretation of words in a description that is contained in a deed and the jury will determine whether the deed meets the requirements for the legality and sufficiency. A court or legislature cannot bestow this authority to any persons or agency. So the role of the, the, the court is significant and it works together with the um, testimony given by licensed surveyors. Section 1.11, Royal Property. Page 20. Note this. Um, middle of the paragraph. Real property is fixed, immovable, and permanent, whereas personal property is consumable, it can be destroyed, or is movable at will. So the real property is actually land and uh, has a fixed location. It doesn't go anywhere. All right? But your um, personal property it, can, it has a different interpretation of it. Standing timber in reality, um, on page 21, standing timber in reality, cut logs may or may not be personal, uh, may not be personality. All right, so this is an example where timber here, it's, um, it's on, it's attached to the property, but you can actually move the timber. Cut logs may or may not be any um, sort of a personal property. What constitutes real property? Section 1.12. Principle 4. A person or land owner can legally convey only the quality and the quantity of interest to which he or she has title. Okay, so that's all you can convey. Uh, you cannot convey anything else in terms of um, uh, on page 22, the paragraph title. To land does not constitute real property. Title in real property law is a right or means by which one can claim just or legal possession to a parcel of land. So, title cannot be used in in a, in, a, in the context of um, that title is uh, is total ownership of the property. Land is a solid material of the earth solid rock, clay, sand, lava, minerals, and so on, real property has become synonymous with land. It is, in this, in its broadest description, real property is, is four-dimensional, all right? You have the X, Y, and Z value, which is your um, east things, northern, and your height above mean sea level, but also the fourth dimension is changes in time. The average survey attorney and court visualize real property or land in two-dimensional length and width. Yet the visionary surveyors are able to see that land or real property is composed of also depth and also changes in time. So you want to have a good understanding of what that involves and what is and that constitutes what real property is about. Yeah. Continuation. Um, the common law rule, page 22, uh, in terms of what constitutes real property, uh, the owner of the surface fee owned everything. So the owner of, in terms of the owner of the surface is above the ground, that owns the fee simple, owns everything above the surface, has been modified by case law, primarily because of air navigation. Um, today, the general rule is that the owner of the f of the fee simple um, a, a whichever whatever airspace he or she can control or use, but the theories and case law 
on the use and control of airspace are not uniform from state to state. So what they're trying to say here is that um, with common law, it can be very, um, uh, it can, it varied from state to state in terms of what people own. Uh, if you have a track of land, um, it can vary in terms of your ownership of what is above the ground. All right, how far into the airspace do you actually own? Technically, air waves, sound waves, air flights, and other violation of airspace is trespass. And under common law, a surveyor would be prohibited from using electronic distance meter across a person's property. So, so using an EDM across a uh, someone else's property can, um, or in on, in your in common law, um, can be looked at one as being a trespass. So, very very interesting. To note. At times, surveyors have been asked to define, locate, and describe certain air rights in relation to signs, evaluated, uh, sorry, elevated walkways, and scenic or visual parameters. So, um, in certain areas, if there's a big demand for, in terms of identifying um, where above the track of land do I have, or do I own, um, in terms of um, how far up in the air do I own in terms of air rights? If I want to put up a sign, um, can someone come in and put up a sign that can be encroaching into my property? And if you want to put also elevated walkways across a track of land, is that uh, allowed? Um, what is the legality behind it? In recent years, several states have modified this concept because they now consider waters as m uh, migratory in nature and as being owned in common. That is, the surface owner owns the waters in common with other landowners and has the right to use a portion of the water for his or her benefit. So, the waters of, um, like in rivers, uh, it is. Uh, Continuation, page 23. Mineral ownership, mineral rights, and oil, coal, gravel, sand, oil, gas are all important um, uh, resources that can have also, um, you know, a location on the Earth's surface. Even though oil and gas are classified as mineral, they are migratory in nature and are incapable of absolute ownership as a thing in place. With respect to ownership, next paragraph, of lands adjoining tide waters, lakes, or rovers, riparian rights attached to the land. However, the nature of riparian rights is still being determined by our courts. So, riparian rights and um, coastal waters, uh, coastal co uh, coastline riparian rights, are all important legal um, concepts. That surveyors and them need to be aware and have a general idea of the legalities behind them. Vines, next paragraph, trees, crops, shrubs, and other growth are considered for most purposes as part of the land which the roots are attached. So, um, in terms of the vegetation, do have a, uh, uh, a location on the earth's surface. And it can be if there are any uh, issues between uh, property owners, these uh, these will have to be defended. The, the natural vegetation. Page twenty-three, principle six. Although there are no federal laws of real property rights, uh, property rights are identified by state laws and are protected by the U.S. Constitution. When decisions relating to real property rights are litigated, even with the federal government as a party, state laws control the litigation. So it gives you an idea about who's in charge in terms of uh, um, if there are any issues regarding real property. It can start from the federal government or they can even go, uh, or it can be a state law. Okay. This may not be so if boundary problem is at is at the issue. For example, if we're looking at state boundaries between neighboring states, uh, it might be a, uh, a state uh, issue or even as far as a federal issue. 
Control over real property falling within all state borders are not retained by the federal government as states entered the union of the 14th and the 5th amendment became controlling. Principle 7, page 23. Real property rights are determined according to the laws in effect in the particular locale where the land is located. English common law is the predominant law and is described as the Lexi Loki. FYI. Page 24. Although the paragraph, you want to know this, although there are no federal law of real property, there exists federal civil law that is applicable to those lands uh, that originate from the GLO, the General Land Office system of surveyors. The first federal law enacted still in effect today is the Land Act of 1785 and you want to learn that particular year and the act. We'll talk about a bit more of the GLO and the USPLS later on. Although few states have enacted statutes to direct and control state surveyors, most states apply common law principles to the location of boundaries. Most of the states in this category have relied on common law. So um, common law is a, a, a um, is uh, is more used in most of the states. Need to know that. Section one point one three. The nature of modern estates. Um, the first paragraph. Um, the modern surveyor should be familiar with what constitutes an estate and we did mention about uh, the description of what an, an, an estate consists of early on this is important in that the modern survey usually recovers more and more older document than does the attorney uh, with the modern survey they tend to go do a lot of detailed research when they're doing when they're looking at the chain of title um, usually they go back 30, 40 years or three generations or so. Uh, an estate is the interest that a person has in real property, real or personal property. In general, real estates are classified by the time of enjoyment and they are identified as follows. Is it an estate in fee? We talked about that earlier on. What is fee? Is it an estate for life? Is it an estate for years? Is it an estate at will? Various types of estates. Estate in fee. Sometimes called an estate in fee simple is the most absolute interest a person can have in land. Uh, the duration in fee, uh, usually it could be considered as being in, on, in perpetuity. A defensible fee in your book. Um, uh, a defensible fee simple estate is one in which the future event must be met. So there's a condition in the future um, or that will certainly affect the estate. The title is conveyed on the condition that certain things will be done within a time period or that certain things will never be done. So a defensible fee could be for example someone who uh, a young person who would uh, obtain the title <coughs> on the condition that they get a degree or something like that. <coughs> an estate for life is an estate limited to the life of, a, of the person, the person holding it. An estate for years is usually created by at least between two parties whose relationship is out of the landlord and the tenant. And lastly, an estate at work. Section, section 1.14 Taxes on land and tax map. Um, it's one of the many ways that the local jurisdiction would get money um, in order to provide services for the local community. Uh, page 25. One of the obligations of and responsibilities of land ownership is the requirement to pay taxes on any property title in the landowner's name. So, as we said earlier on, your property has a location that will never change. 
and because of that uh, because of its location it has certain uh, uh, the landowner has certain responsibilities in making sure that it is kept up to date and all the taxes are paid and um, one of the way the local authorities can provide those services by is by collecting taxes for prop from property owners taxes for the operation of government services taxes for police taxes for waste disposal all of these are example of services that local authorities the jurisdiction collect money in order to have a, a community that is safe and uh, that is a safe environment and also provides the re re basic necessities required to, to, to have a comfortable life. Usually, next paragraph, the land parcels are located on tax maps and are identified by land parcel ID number. A, a track of land has a unique ID number that shows a jigsaw co uh, compilation of land parcels that are identified by the names of the record holders and the individual parcels. So all jurisdictions will have tax maps and revenue office will be collecting, managing all of those data in order to collect the taxes. Courts have held that tax maps cannot be used as evidence to ascertain boundaries. So a lot of the end users, the general public, believe that a tax map is what's going to help you find your boundaries, and it's not. It's a uh, certified, uh, uh, signed um, plat done by a licensed land survey that will stand up in court. They can only be used the tax map can only be used to identify who is paying the taxes in a, in the general vicinity of where the track of land is located. Some surveyors are prone to use tax maps to identify land boundaries. Courts are hesitant to permit this because uh, this type of map usually is not sealed by a survey, a licensed land survey, and does not meet minimum standards of map preparation. Courts have held a tax map is admissible for limited purposes. And the courts will do that, um, but a lot of uh, section 1.15 easement and licenses. First paragraph, although of a legal nature, servitudes, restrictions, covenants, and conditions coincident with the land ownership should be understood by the practice and surveyor. And all of these are uh, terms that we'll be covering in more detail later on. Uh, an easement is commonly uh, understood by licensed surveyors, maybe on the surface on the ground. It's a, an easement is the use of someone else's property, property for the good of another. Maybe on the surface of the ground or maybe located in the air as well as beneath the surface of the land which may include waters as well. A surveyor located mineral rights may find that the mineral on page this one page 26 may find that the mineral located are, are thousands of feet below the surface of the earth but here the survey is uh, is is um, hired to identify where that mineral rights is located surveyors attorneys and courts often confuse easements unlike with licenses but they are actually different in many ways so no there's a distinction between a license and an easement which we'll cover just now one of the more important aspects of easement is location as well as permitted use and still more important the duration so an easement is using someone else's land for the good of another um, for a certain time period or uh, for a particular use and there are various reasons upon which uh, various types of easements are available out there. An easement is one of the many bundles of rights that enjoy a boundary or boundaries. An affirmative or positive easement permits, this, these are two, one, well, one type, two names, permits the, the possessor of the easement to do some physical act on it. All right, it's a positive easement under or over the lands of another. All right, so, so if someone else, uh, the non, um, the the owner, is actually providing. Um, uh, he is actually being uh, required to provide a certain uh, allowance or use by another property owner on his on the the owner's property. Um, 
the land that benefits is called a dominant easement so the person who um, is actually uh, using someone else's land is called a do dominant estate and the land to which the easement is attached uh, so the person who's owning the property and is not getting the full use of it but but someone else is getting full use of it is called a servient estate so you want to learn dominant estate and servient estate Uh, continuation there yeah? on easement and licenses page 27 the most common method of creating an easement is through an express conveyance such as a deed or a will so your deed would have uh, the word easements and, uh, and actually some of them actually have a description delineating the easement those deeds uh, that that describe and convey an easement strictly without deed and track of the land and fee are known as deeds of easement or easement deeds so you want to learn that if there is a, a deed that has an easement it's referred to as easement deeds easement may also be created by express reservations or exceptions in a deed of conveyance by exception the grantor is not conveying that, that which normally would be included and is retaining that which is being expected so um, by exception in the deed an easement can be indirectly created according to the general rule of the law when the owner of the tract of land conveys part of it to another all right so uh, the original owner is the servient and the owner is said to grant it by implication by implying all the easements that are apparent and obvious and th that are necessary for the fair enjoyment of the land granted so uh, by implication the in the, the 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 dominant person is getting the benefit of it if an owner retains the rare portion of a lot and fails to provide himself or herself um, an easement to his or her portion in many but not all states he or she will have an implied easement so whether or not you did not imply did not specify that there was an easement there are in situations in some states where um, if you have a landlock situation and you do not realize it that uh, this the local jurisdiction and the, and the courts would have what they refer to as an implied easement in order to get access to the back of the property easements can be created by estoppel which is a, a, a prevention of from from some someone from doing something on a property in legal terms an e uh, estoppel is a legal bar raised by the law which precludes a person because of his or her conduct from a certain rights that he or she might otherwise have so it's a prevention um, a per preventing a person from doing certain uh, rights that have um, that would that they would otherwise do the entire transaction or document of uh, um, conveying the parcel and will determine whether an easement is implied at the time of conveyance. Page 27, uh, continuation. Uh, second to last paragraph on page 27 from the bottom. Easements may be granted because of necessity. The courts have held that if two or more parcels are so situated that an easement over one or more is strictly a necessary situation for the enjoyment of the other, they will find an easement exists of necessity. An, an easement of necessity exists only for a period of time during which a necessity exists so there's a time period uh, time attachment to this type of easement once an alternative means is available the necessity and the easement cease to exist so that's where it becomes nullified the requirements for creation of an easement by prescription 
as follows. One, adverse use without permission, open and notorious use, continuous use, use for a specific purpose, and then lastly, use for the statutory period. So there's a time period. There's also various types of use and for a specific time, um, specific purpose of that easement. Uh, so the, this is the five um, requirements. Page 28, an easement, um, middle of the top paragraph, an easement may potentially be unlimited in duration or may be created to last for a limited time period. So in which the case in, in which case the easement expires according to the its own terms. Easements created for a specific purpose expire when the purpose has been accomplished. So if the purpose of creating the um, easement is explicit and let's say a few uh, later on that purpose diminishes, then the easement also diminishes as well. Easements next paragraph may always be extinguished through a release agreed upon by the parties involved if there's an agreement made that nullifies the easement then that is where it's extinguished um, easement can also be destroyed um, for the fourth, fourth paragraph down destruction of the Soviet easement as by loss of the land due to erosion can terminate an easement as well. Um, destruction for building existing on easement may also terminate an easement. So these are some methods of which easements are nullified or, or, or um, terminated. And lastly, the owner of an easement under certain circumstances may terminate the easement by abandonment is another form of nullifying it. So please learn the various ways of an e how, for how an easement can. In summary, an easement has three, has these characteristics. Um, it is an interest in the land. The interest must be in the land of another. So you want to learn all of these characteristics. The, car the easement is non-possessionary because the owner of the easement can only prevent interference with his or her interest. The privilege to use an easement must be capable of creation of it. The easement should be described by definite accurate boundaries. And, and once you do this, then do you know, um, th this is a very good description of the common characteristics of what an easement is about. The last paragraph on page 28, for most land surveys, the, the land survey is asked to certify that there is no encroachment on the land or to show any uh, or to show easements. On um, page 29, um, it gives you a, very, a good description or a good um, definition of what is a license, as we said early on easements and license are sometimes misunderstood uh, a license the paragraph on page 29 a license is a personal revocable and usually unassignable permission or authority to do acts on the land of another without possession of an interest in the land so a license for example where it's personal revocable for example you can get a license to hunt someone's property all right for hunting rights be able to do take out a license to hunt someone's property the main distinguishing feature between an easement and a license the license is revocable so you want to know that you can take away the license while an easement you cannot just take it away there's certain um characteristics and, and, and conditions an oral agreement to permit passage across an adjoiner's land without documents as required by the statute of road is nothing more than an oral license all right an easement will be all um, written down it's on a document a servia or survey crew last paragraph Passing over a person's property with permission has a license. Without permission, the section 1.16 servitude 
restrictions, covenants, and conditions. You want to learn these definitions. First paragraph under section 1.16. A servitude is a restriction or a limited um, real right over another person's property that entitles the whole of the servitude to certain powers of use and enjoyment or prohibits um, prohibitions of the use in relation to that property. So servitude is certainly it's a, an, an ability given to someone to do something on someone else's property um, and certain powers of use in relation to that property. The condition of the ownership of the restricted property is termed as servitude. So that condition is referred to as the, as the servitude. And the land itself uh, has a burden placed upon it. By law, servitude may be classified as real or personal. A real servitude, such as an easement, is a right or rights established in favor of the parts of the land, meaning the dominant person who is getting the benefit of using someone else's property. So we call that the dominant tenement. Over the second parcel, who the owner of the property is the service tenement. As with easement, servitudes may be classified as being positive. It can be a positive or it can be negative. Servitudes have traditionally been classified as either rural or urban. Rural servitudes are concerned primarily with land example grazing grazing of cattle or animals right of ways and water and are usually positive urban urban servitudes are concerned with residential commercial industrial properties and are usually negative for example drainage support party walls light and air sewer and views these are all negative um, servitudes in an urban environment a covenant now is an agreement between persons or parties that restrict the use of a freehold property. It's a restriction of um, between different parties of a freehold property. <coughs> Page 30. A covenant uh, contained in a conveyance instrument, meaning a covenant stated in a, in a, in a, a deed, a conveyance instrument here is referred to as a deed, is an agreement usually to restrain from doing certain acts and may take on certain forms. These three of them are examples of covenants. Covenants contain an agreement between more than one party, usually in the same neighborhood or subdivision. Covenants contain in the deed of a single parcel. And then covenants and conditions or restrictions contain in the deed on the plot of a subdivision owner, binding all owners or purchasers of the lot within that subdivision. So there are covenants there that actually sets of rules that everyone within um, the document has to follow. Uh, last sentence in that paragraph. These restrictions will be binding on all future owners whether they have actual notice or not. So it's very important when you bind property to know if there are any covenants attached with the, um, the, prop the said property that you're purchasing. Section 1.17 action on boundaries and easements principle eight once boundary lines are created the contiguous lines may by law or by the actions of landowners who have vested rights be changed or altered so you do have some flexibility in terms of the boundaries of the easement um, most legal actions next paragraph relative to land can be placed into one of the following categories uh, the legal action with regard to easements uh, it can be one a question of title this is primarily a lawyer's domain who, who owns title a question of the boundary this should be a surveyor's um, responsibility where is that boundary and if there are uh, legal action can be a combination of the two of them Another type of um, uh, legal action is your uh, 
category two where it can be subdivided into this one here category two it can be subdivided into a question of what is the boundary and where is the boundary so uh, quite a few legal actions that is associated with um, the possibility of you know an easement occurring um, should there be a problem between the dominant and servient boundaries are unique next paragraph and that the invisible lines are subject to modification the actions, uh, major doctrines recognized for boundary modifications or um, changing as follows. There are, they can, they, these actions can be because by way of agreement, it can be written or oral by um, estoppel, acquiescence for a long period of time living on the property, adverse possession for public good, and also lastly um, these mod boundary modification could be based upon judicial action by the courts making a uh, decision on, on a problem or certain um, conflict between the owners section 1.18 one unique parcel or is it a bound or boundary pa principle 9 law does not provide for two original description of the same parcel there is only one parcel on the earth surface of every track of land on the earth surface only one unique parcel the responsibility uh, of a land surveyor can be in, in one or two areas as the creating surveyor or uh, are you the original surveyor or are you the retracing surveyor as technology improves, next paragraph, middle of the second paragraph, as technology improves, the initial instrumentation of the original survey must remain in the controlling elements. The original survey created the footsteps of the before the retracing survey to follow. So um, the challenge here is that if you're doing a uh, retracement, you basically have to go back and be in the footsteps of the original survey, not the retracing survey. Principle 10, multiple boundaries description, may exist for the same parcel but only one is controlling and this is where you're going to have you will later on see or hear about the pin cushion effect where at one corner you have various pins with the or monuments placed and that is unfortunate um, surveyors should be able to rely on other surveyors past work and use that not add to a, mul uh, a multitude of monuments at one corner land is described next paragraph as a bundle of rights where the composite picture of the land includes some elements as minerals soil timber and water with each of these elements the boundaries may exist independently of each other so all of these can be independently of each other principle 11 um, there can only be one original boundary and description all subsequent ones is a retracement <coughs> the original boundaries are sacred page 32 the creating surveyor must first conduct the fieldwork and prepare the subsequent record whether it uh, it be field notes or plat to a degree of sufficiency that any subsequent survey or any retracing survey will have little trouble to follow uh, with little, little trouble and few problems in retracing the original work on the ground in using today's technology so you have the original survey doing our, doing his work and preparing notes and plot or the uh, you know whatever information that they have so that any subsequent survey who is a retracing survey can walk in the original survey's footsteps land and the accompanying interests have the following attributes um, they are without error so once you do a survey out in the field for the first time that track of land was surveyed then it is without error they are unassizable through the courts they are permanent even if no evidence is found to identify them 
once they're out there they're out there they are they can be retraced and redefined by retracements but could never be changed so land have and it's a company that has certain uh, attributes that a lot of lawyers and courts would defend principle 12 a resurvey can be conducted only by the entry who only by the entity who um, conducted the original survey the law provides for resurveys of parcel but only on a limited basis and under certain restrictions the main one being that of the bona fide property rights granted under the previous sex survey and are jeopardized two classes of resurveys are recognized dependent surveys and independent surveys and they all depend it all it all the dependent surveys depends upon previous surveys independent surveys is a court decided matter Subsequent to the original survey that created the boundaries when certain requirements or conditions are met, resurveys may be ordered. All right, this concludes the second half of the first chapter. Please go over the audio, read your textbook, on, uh, you know, learn the terminologies, the, the legal terms, and the, and the various uh, limitations. We did cover a lot in this chapter, and we'll continue with the next one, next class.